Well, hello there again. Here we are, English 211, listening and speaking. And today, what are we speaking about? A new topic. This is our new unit, Unit 5, Lifestyles Around the World. Style is the way you do things, and in different countries, people have different lifestyles. Also, within a country, people in different professions or different areas might have different lifestyles. And what we're going to be talking about in the conversation single parents, a very common phenomenon today. Our lecture, which you will hear today, is The Changing Family. Of course, this is an American book, so we're talking about the American family. Uh, meaning from context, we'll be talking about lifestyles. And then our task will be using numbers, percentages, and graphs. Huh? But today, we want to get into the subject, but let's look at our quotation. This is a well-known quotation today. It takes a village to raise a child. Now, what does that mean? It means a child learns from not just from his parents and his brothers and sisters. He learns from all the people around. Now, I don't think here you have, that's not such a problem because you have large families, you have many relatives. But now many times in places like London or New York, uh, someone may grow up in an apartment and just sees his mother or his father, doesn't have much social contact with other types of people. So that's the idea. It takes a village. Huh? It's not good to just be very limited. You learn from a lot of different people. Okay, let's get the context of our conversation uh, today. Here we have two young men looking together, and we're asked to describe the relationship. Most of my students say this is probably brother, a big brother and a little brother. I think that's very possible. I think he looks very young to be the father. It could be. Uh, where are they? Well, they're in the house somewhere. It looks like in maybe a playroom or a study room or a work room, but certainly at home. What is the man doing? He's working on his laptop, and the little boy is playing with his car there. He's having a nice time. Imagine a typical day for this man. How is it different from a typical day for your parents when you were a child? Well, hard to say. Times have changed. It was a hard life for most of our parents. They had to get up much earlier than we do. They had to work longer hours than we do. So probably our, our day is an easier one than that of our parents. Now we move to the actual subject of our conversation. Remember, a single parent. And here we have a picture of Sharon, a single parent. A single parent means she's alone. She, her husband is not there. We don't know if her husband died, whether her husband's left, her husband works somewhere else, but she's all alone bringing up the child. And we're going to hear about the situation for Sharon. And that is the conversation that we're going to hear very soon. Pre-listening questions. What does it mean to ask someone for a favor? To ask for a favor, you want somebody to do something for you, not for money, just to be nice, huh? So let's say that I'm sitting in the, you know, in the airport and I'm reading a book and I need a tissue, I want to sneeze, I could ask someone and say, do you mind, could you do me a favor, give me a tissue or something. So a favor is something nice you do for someone, clearly not for money, huh? Uh, number two, we talked about this. What is a single parent? A parent who is alone. Usually it will be a lady, but sometimes a man may lose his wife. Uh, a man may be uh, taking care of a child, and so he's then a single parent. Uh, three, what kinds of challenges do you think single parents face? Well, if you are a single parent, maybe you have to work. That means your child need someone else to take care of it, huh? So, yeah, special challenge. A lot of people today, and we're going to hear about that later. Vocabulary. Let's look at our vocabulary here. As we oftentimes note, sometimes we have uh, phrases, sometimes words. I think all of these are phrases. I will look into your problem as soon as I have time. We say look into is a phrasal verb, two-word verb. Huh? It has more than one word look into, and we chose C to find information about something. Huh? Someone comes to me and says, uh, 
you know, um, I didn't understand, the, you know, the quiz last week. I say, well, I'll look into it. I'll check on it. I'll see what the problem was. Number two, if I don't take off right this minute, I'm going to miss my bus. Well, this is a very colloquial use of take off. And, of course, we've chosen E, meaning to leave. Huh? Now, you wouldn't use this formally. Huh? This means to leave quickly, and it's in spoken English, not in written English. Number three, a plane takes off, but that's different. People usually just leave. I must leave. But if you want to be uh, a little bit more figurative in your language, yes, I need to take off. I have to leave quickly. Number three, my mother is very old-fashioned. She doesn't like new ideas. Old-fashioned, adjective, doing things in the old way. So what do we have here? Be not modern. Modern is the opposite of old-fashioned. Uh, number four, Time is running, let me move that cursor there. Time is running out for me to finish this paper. It's due tomorrow. Running out means it's going, it's not there anymore. So if it is running out, it means it's almost gone. So what did we choose? D, to end. Well, once it has run out, if it is running out, it's almost finished, huh? almost ended. Okay, Yeah, close to the end. If I say my money has run out, that means, yes, I have none. But if it is running out, I mean I have a little. It has not yet run out, okay? Maybe we should make that distinction. Number five, my mother is sick. I want to check up on her on my way home from work. Check up on, to make sure about. Notice your A, to see if someone is okay. It can be someone. You can check up on your notes. You can check up on a person or on things. Now, I'm going to ask you to listen to this conversation and to try and hear the answers to these questions. What does Sharon want from Alicia? Why? What surprised Mari about Sharon? And three, how does Mari feel about bringing up a child alone without help from relatives? Remember, Mari is from a different country, from a different culture. She's from Japan. Sharon and Alicia are from America. Sharon has a special problem, and Mari is surprised. Okay, let's see. Listen to the conversation. Alicia, who's there? Sharon, it's Sharon and Joey. Alicia, hi, come on in. What's happening? Sharon, can you do me a big favor? I just got a call from the office. They want me to look into a computer problem right away. Would you mind watching Joey until I get back? Alicia, sure, no problem. Is he asleep? Sharon, yeah, he just fell asleep ten minutes ago. He usually sleeps for a couple of hours at this time of day. But if he wakes up, just give him a bottle. Mari, oh, what a cute baby. He's so little. Alicia, uh, Mari, this is a neighbor, Sharon, and her son, Joey. Uh, Sharon, this is our new roommate, Mari. Mari, nice to meet you. You two, listen, I've got to take off. Thanks so much for helping me out. Mari, Alicia and Mari, bye. Mari, hey, I didn't know that you liked looking after babies. Alicia, well, Joey is special. I take care of him from time to time when Sharon's busy. And then she does favors for me in return. Like last week, she lent me her car. Mari, and her husband, is he? Alicia, uh, she's widowed, actually. Mari, really? Alicia, yes, but I think she's happy being a mother. Nancy, hi. Mari, Alicia, hi. Nancy, uh, what were you talking about? Alicia, that my neighbor, Sharon, is very happy to have a baby. Nancy, oh yeah, she and her husband were worried that time was running out. You know, like, what if they never had a baby? Mari, maybe I'm old-fashioned, but I could never bring up a baby by myself. I think it would be so difficult. Nancy, yeah, raising a child is tough. I'm really lucky I met Andrew. Mari, and if you have a baby, you'll have Alicia to help you with babysitting. Alicia, we'll see. Speaking of babysitting, I'd better check up on Joey. A lot of people there. 
Sharon with Joey, Nancy coming in, Mari and Alicia. Okay, what does Sharon want from Alicia? Did you hear that? What does she want? She wants Alicia to take care of, to look after Joey, because she has to go into work. That's why she had a call from work. She has to go in quickly. She needs someone to take care of the baby. So Joey will be taken care of by Alicia. What surprised Mari about Sharon? Well, Mari is surprised that she's bringing up a child alone. She says she could never do that. It would be very difficult. She says maybe it's old-fashioned. She finds it hard to believe someone could do that. Number three, how does Mari feel about bringing up a child alone? Well, we just heard it's something that she thinks is very difficult. We heard the term tough, huh? tough, T-O-U-G-H, very difficult. It's tough doing that. All right, so that was our conversation. Now we come to another pronunciation aspect. It's at the bottom of your page there. Um, two and three word verbs. Many verbs in English consist of two or three words. The first word is a verb, and the second and third words are usually prepositions. In grammar, we usually say they are particles because they're not functioning as prepositions, are they? In most of these verbs, the second word receives the stress. Listen to these examples. The plane took off at 7 o'clock. John checked up on his mother. Please drop me off at the corner. Now, in our lecture, we had a number of these two or three word verbs. For example, come on in. They want me to look into a computer problem right away. Three, if he wakes up, just give him a bottle. Wakes up. I know it's the stress on the particle. Four, listen, I've got to take off. Five, thanks so much for helping me out. Huh? Help out. Huh? N number six, I take care of him from time to time when Sharon's with take care of. Huh? Take care of is really three words. Huh? Seven, she and her husband were worried that, that time was running out, to run out. Eight, I could never bring up a baby by myself. Bring up, I hope you know, means to raise from a child. Huh? Parents raise or bring up their children. Or nine, I better check up on Joy. Check up to see if there's any problem. Now, we had a nice close exercise. I hope you did this or will do it. Here I've solved it for you. Babies, special, huh? notice this word, S-P-E-C, huh? Now, we have different words with special. Huh? We have especially and specially, species, huh? but many times pronounced as a sh. Okay? Busy, husband, a widowed. We didn't discuss this word. A widow is a person who's lost her husband. Huh? So the husband dies, we say the man, the woman is a widow. If the woman dies, the man is a widower. The word widow is much commoner in English. So widow is a common word. We usually use the feminine and not the masculine. Huh? Usually if a man, we'd say his, his wife died. It's not so, but the proper term is a widower as opposed to a widow. So she was widowed means her husband has died. Okay, happy and neighbor. Don't forget that E-I-G-H in there. And we were worried. Huh? Uh, they, not we were worried, they were worried. That means Sharon and her husband were worried time was running out for having a baby. Uh, and then I'm old-fashioned. Notice the hyphen. Old-fashioned is one word with a hyphen in the middle connecting it. Myself, babysitting. Okay, I think those are all words that you are acquainted with. Now we come to reductions. Every unit we have our reductions to do. These are new type. These are with prepositions. Notice that if I have a statement, I give, of course, I'll have an object, I give him. But if we have another object, I give him, it becomes I give him, huh? in many times in speaking, huh? or in very reduced speech, I give him, give him. Huh? But you should be able to identify, I give him my money, would mean I give him. I give them my money, would be I give them, I give her my money. Huh? So these are unstressed pronouns, indirect pronouns, unstressed. 
The letter H is often not pronounced when a word is unstressed, such as him, her, has. Huh? Notice here e examples. Number one, unreduced. Is he asleep? Becomes is he, a, is he instead of is he. Number two, the children have gone. Becomes the children of, children of, go of gone. Huh? Of. Sometimes it says, you know, my parents have gone. You should know the of means have. Uh, number three, unreduced. Here's the newspaper. Notice the H is not dropped because it is at the beginning of the sentence. Okay, okay, we can't drop it here. We can't say ears. Okay, but in the other cases, H's were dropped. All right, let's look at the next ones, and you are to decide what is dropped. Listen to these, and I hope you can hear what is being dropped. Remember that when you're tested, I will give you. You will hear a form. And I'll give you like, is he, and you have to choose. Does that mean, is they, is he, and you choose the written full form. Huh? But let's do this now, listening for reduction. Listen to the following sentences from the conversation. Repeat them after the speaker. Draw a slash through any H sounds. Example, is he asleep? Is he? The H was not pronounced. Listen to the next one. If he wakes up, just give him a bottle. If he w if he wakes up, just give him a bottle. Now it's very clear it's him and not them. If you because if he if he wakes up, if it was there, be if they wake up, just give them. Huh? But you should hear the difference. Number two. Thanks so uh, so much for helping me out. Huh? For helping me out. For helping me out. Huh? Don't have an age for helping me, for helping me. Huh? Number three, I take care of him from time to time. I take care of him, um, um, for him. Huh? And and her husband, and her, her husband, her husband, her husband, her husband. Hi. Notice here the H. We cannot reduce it because it's at the beginning. Huh? Hi. <laughs> you can say I. <laughs> I is very different than hi. Okay. Number six. You'll have Alicia to help you with babysitting. You'll have Alicia to help you with, huh? Notice those H's have disappeared. We call that reduced, huh? Get used to it. All right. Now, using the vocabulary after you've listened. Work in pairs to practice the new vocabulary. Well, I'm the, if you're going to work in a pair, I must be the other part of the pair. So, let's have a look at this. Uh, student A should look at page 248, should look at page 256. Number one, do you sometimes argue with your parents because you think their ideas are old-fashioned? Well, I don't know. I hope not. But sometimes there are disagreements. Uh, older people sometimes have a different view, maybe about how long your hair should be or how long you should stay, uh, stay out at night. It's possible. And the older person will always be accused of being old-fashioned. I will, uh, I will tell you the fact I have even been accused of being old fat. You won't believe it, but that is true. Number two, you often run out of time in exams. This could happen. I know it happens to my students. It will not happen in my exams because the exam is by a cassette. So when the cassette stops, of course, the exam is done. You know, so you'll have enough time. Okay, it goes. Number three, would you like looking into working as a daycare provider? Well, if you like taking care of children, you might look into it. If you are mechanically inclined, you might look into engineering. If you are uh, inclined to novels and plays, you might look into literature. It means to find out more about it. Uh, then we have language functions. Uh, these are not things I'm teaching you in the sense that you have to remember how to do them, but you should recognize them when you hear them. Asking for help. Can you do me a big favor? Would you mind? Huh? These are ways of requesting. Here are the answer. Sure. No problem. Of course. Naturally. Absolutely. Huh? All nice ways in which you can agree. And you have a nice table on the next page which indicates some of these. You're asking for a favor. Can you, could you, would you, could you give me a hand, could you help me, would you mind? All of these are different ways of requesting. 
you agree? Yes, okay, sure. I'd like, I'd like to, I'd be glad to. The way to refuse, I'm sorry, I'd like to, but. Uh, I would if I could, but I can't, and so on, things like that. Huh? These are things you should recognize. Um, that takes us to the end of the first part of Unit 1, but it's not the end of our work today because you have another lecture. And the subject of the lecture is about the changing American family. I hope you find this interesting. Now remember, the best thing you can do is now listen to this. Try to understand it. Identify words that you don't know. We'll be practicing them later. But the best thing you can do is to listen to this at home, to understand. You might like to take notes. If you take notes, you can compare them with the notes we'll be looking at later. Are you ready? I need some refreshment. Well, okay, now I'm ready. Here we go. This is your lecture for Unit 5, The Changing American Family. Have you ever seen the old television show, Father Knows Best? You probably haven't. I have, because it was a popular comedy show in the 1950s, way before you were born. And I'm sure of that, because I was a little boy at that time. So it's certainly before your time. Now, this show was very popular. It was about a family, a typical family, a father who went to work every day, a mother who stayed home and took care of the house. The children, there were two or three of them, I think. Anyway, in those days, that was considered a typical American family. Things have changed. Today, the American family is very different. And that's what I want to tell you about today. The typical family of the 1950s is not the typical family of the early 21st century. Let me explain what I mean. First of all, families are smaller today than before. I mean, people have fewer children. Secondly, more and more children are growing up in a single parent family. That means they have only a mother or a father around to take care of them. Now, I'm not going to go into the reasons for that. That's a big subject. I want to focus, however, on another third and probably the most important change in the American family the last 50 years, the role of married mothers, mothers who are working. And the, we'll look into the effects of this new rule, this new role that mothers have. Remember, in the 1950s, you would expect the woman to be staying at home, just taking care of children, but that has changed. Let's look at the statistics on this. In the 1950s, 11% of married mothers in America worked outside the home. About 10%, 11%, 1 in 10. In 2002, that's 50 years later, 70% worked outside the home. Now that's a, a major change in 50 years, in two generations, from about 10% to 70%. Now, we ask, why? Why has this happened? Well, I'm going to state two main reasons. First, the need for money. People today need more money. The cost of living is higher, and most families find they need two salaries in order to make ends meet. At least they think that. Now, the other reason we find more and more married mothers working is they have more opportunities. A woman has more possibilities than they did back in the 1950s or even the 1960s. Uh, some of this is established by law, that women must have the same opportunity to go to college and to get jobs. So today, women are working in professions that were not open to them 30 or 40 years ago. To give just one example, today more than half of the students in American medical schools are women. So in other words, future doctors of medicine, it would seem over half of them will be women. At least that's the way it is. Now if you went back to the 1950s, I would assume maybe 10% were women. Now it's more than half. Okay, Big change. So uh, to summarize what we've said so far, 
we've seen the American family has changed dramatically since the days of Father Knows Best in the 1950s. In the typical two-parent family today, both the mother and the father have jobs. This means that most American homes don't have a full-time homemaker. A woman who stays home and works in the home is a homemaker and no longer is the woman a full-time homemaker. So this creates new problems. Huh? Change, we have a problem. What are they? Who will take care of the babies? Who will take care of the grandparents? Who will go out to do the shopping? Who will do the cooking? Who will do the cleaning? Who will be the volunteer at the children's school? And so on. These are tasks that traditionally were taken care of by the homemaker. Now, to help families with working parents deal with these problems, some changes have been made. Let's hear what some of them are. One of them is that American businesses, in many cases, have introduced new programs and policies to make it easier for people to work and raise children. I'm going to give you five examples. Now We heard, heard the change in the family. Now we hear how the job market or the job situation has adjusted to help out this new situation. The first policy is called maternity leave. Maternity comes from the Latin root mater, meaning mother. So maternity leave is a vacation for the woman when she has a baby. What we're talking about is not something totally new. To American law now requires people to give a woman up to 12 weeks of leave when she has a baby. Uh, the problem is the companies aren't required to pay for these 12 weeks. So you may get 12 weeks off, but it may be paid or unpaid. Depends on your company. Recently, some companies, at least big ones, have started to give paid maternity leave, but it is still not usual. Uh, by the way, a small percentage of companies now also offer paternity leave. Pater, the father. So the father even gets time off when a new baby comes. I would like to see such a law and requiring all companies to give paid leave to both mothers and fathers for a new baby. But there are, this, at least there's a concession. Uh, some companies give maternity leave, some pay for it, some give paternity leave. So all of these are ways of helping people who have a married, uh, who are married and both of them work. Let's look at another way in which companies help working families. Um, as you know, big companies like IBM and uh, General Motors many times have to transfer their workers from one place to another. So if a company transfers the husband, this would be a problem if the wife has a job. So many companies then try to find a job for the wife. If the husband is moving, they try to help and find a job for the the uh, the wife, if the uh, in the other way around, if the wife is moving to find for the husband, huh? So trying to find a job when people transfer. A third policy is called flex time. Flex means to stretch, huh? To change. So flex time means to change the schedule, huh? Not keeping people directly. Now, what do we mean? In the U.S., in most cases, if you're working, you work from nine a.m. to 5 p.m., eight hours. With flex time, workers can choose the hour. They start work in the morning and go home. So the, the mother could go to work at 5 and come back at 12. The man could leave at 12 and come back. So at least they could, one stays home and the other works. It's called flex time, flexibility in the timing. So that would be a good thing for the children. They'd always have at least one parent in the home. And a fourth uh, change I'd like to describe is called tele-working or tele-commuting. Tele always means over a distance. Huh? And so today, in many companies, you can work at home and keep in touch with your company either by a computer or by telephone. Huh? So the people who work at home use the computer or phone to communicate with their workplace. Uh, today, about 15% of the U.S. workforce tele 
commutes. You know the word commute. Commute means to go from your home to your your uh, job. So here you're telecommuting. Actually, you're not traveling. Your information is traveling by computer. So teleworking or tele. Tele, T-E-L-E, huh? like television. Okay. However, the percentage of people teleworking or telecommuting is growing all the time. Um, if parents are allowed to work at home, their children might not have to spend, spend so much time in child care. So if you stay at home, you maybe can also take care of your children. Now, speaking of child care, we come to one other fifth point. Many companies, some of the better companies, offer daycare on site. That is to say the company has a daycare center on, in the company. So people come to work, they bring their children with them, they stay there, and then they can take their children back with them in the evening. So that's another nice idea, offering daycare at the company. Now, um, let me review what I've been talking about. Uh, first, we heard about how the you know, the job, the family is changing, married mothers being a very important part of it. And then we looked at five ways in which policies can be changed or programs can be made to help people who have working uh, mothers and fathers, huh, where the father and mother are working. So um, it's very important to see that this is the direction which the world is going. And so we have to see how this will all work out. But it is certainly part of the changing family scene in America. Thank you.